Hi, I'm Phil Lowe at the Furniture Institute of Massachusetts, and this is the Art of Woodworking. Today, what I'd like to do is to show you a few things about carving. You know, carving's been along, around for quite a bit of time. Uh, you know, some of the earliest carving was actually done almost 450,000 years ago when uh, they discovered, you know, a, a wooden spear that the uh, Paleolithic uh, man had actually carved out in order to kill an elephant and a hippopotamus. And throughout time, uh, you know, tools and uh, techniques and so forth have changed from, you know, using stone type tools all the way through to uh, the Iron Age, and uh, which is what, where it brings us today. What I'd like to do is to really show you some simple techniques of carving so that if you want to get started at this, uh, I'll show you how to do that. So let me get some of this stuff out of the way and we'll, we'll begin. Okay. So what I'd like to do now is show you some of the tools involved in carving. Um, you know, if you actually bought a whole tool set of uh, carving tools, you might end up spending, you know, thousands of dollars and you'd almost end up with a thousand tools. And the reason for that is a lot of the tools are very specific to very specific jobs. For instance, furniture carving tools are certainly different than carving life-size figures. So what you see here on the bench is a variety of tools that I've collected over the years. And what I'd like to do first is just show you uh, what the tools are. And uh, if we start off, uh, usually uh, these tools are numbered. They're one through 25, 26, somewhere around there. And the number ones are actually <laughs> tools that are basically straight across this way. And if you look at uh, this particular tool, it has a bevel on both sides, whereas this one here actually has a single bevel on one side. And you can use, uh, you know, these are used for different purposes. But you'll also notice that these are of different width. Uh, we also have some really narrow ones, which are, are uh, quite narrow. And uh, on some of these tool handles, you'll find that they actually have a number on them. Let me see if I can grab one of these uh, newer tools. So if you look at these numbers on the handle, uh, the number seven determines the curvature of the blade and the number 20 determines the width of the blade. So uh, with that being said, you'll notice that these three tools here range in size from about three eighths of an inch to an inch to about an inch and an eighth, somewhere around there. Um, the, the next series of tools would be a number two, which would be a, uh, let's see what we got here, a number with, uh, I thought we had these in order. Yeah, number two here is, uh, as you can see, this is quite narrow, uh, and we also have one that uh, is relatively wide. So this is a, a number 212, so it indicates that the 2 is actually the curvature, and the 12 is the width. And then we have a, a really small, uh, probably about an eighth inch wide, number 2 as well. So as we go through the, uh, these different sizes, you'll notice that with each number, we'll jump up to a number three here, you'll notice that the curvature on these start to increase. So the threes are gonna have a little bit more, and if we go over to uh, a number, uh, let's see which way we headed here, uh, let's say a number five, we'll pull this one out, you know, the three and the five, if you can actually see the ends of these, you'll notice that the curvature is increase, increases as the uh, numbers go up. So if I jump up to like a number uh, seven, which uh, this one here is quite wide, this is a 725, as opposed to the number three, uh, number five, you'll see the difference in the curvature of the, uh, of the blade. So 
if we're trying to you know, do different designs and so forth, we can incorporate some of these curves in order to create you know, the shapes of the curves that we're trying to develop. So I could certainly use you know, something like this, uh, a tool like this would cut a certain uh, shape in one direction and then use another tool in the uh, opposite direction to uh, get a, a softer curve. So, but also you'll, you'll notice that uh, there's a, a number of other types of tools that are involved in here as well. So if we work our way up, the number nines, which are, you know, these, uh, uh, the eights and the nines, let's see, this is an eight, uh, let's see, this is a number eight, here's a number nine here, you know, the number eight is almost uh, just shy of a half circle, and the, uh, the number nine is just about a half circle. If you look at it directly in from the front, the distance from here to here is about uh, whatever width this is, just say it's a half inch. The distance from up here down to the edge is about a quarter of an inch. And with the eight, it's a little bit less than that. So, um, you know, you have to get used to the numbers and the widths that you're gonna use in order to, um, you know, uh, try to create the work that you're, you're doing. Now there's a few other tools here that are uh, sort of specialty tools. The specialty tools are, you know, tools like you see here. Now what this is, these are what they call straight gouges, which are, you know, perfectly straight in this direction. And then also you have these bent gouges. And these bent gouges are actually used to, you know, go, go down inside of, you know, a hollow in order to, you know, to be able to take the uh, material away, as opposed to a straight one, whereas if I tried to cut into a hollow, what happens is the, the edge becomes engaged, the, the, the uh, back of the chisel starts to hit and actually makes it jump so you don't get a smooth cut. So... You know, these are very specific. This happens to be a V tool, which is actually, um, you know, at, uh, you know, a, diff uh, a couple of angles that you might have here. And then we have a couple of uh, bent gouges. This is a seven and an eight. And again, the seven is a little shallower and the eight is a little deeper. So now um, there's also a couple of other different types of tools, which are what we call spoon gouges. Now, if you look at this particular one here, the spoon actually, if you look at it, it's almost like a spoon. If you're gonna eat with it or something like that. So it's a real radical bend right on the end of the tool as opposed to a long bend that has got a really long, oh, that's why they call them a long bend. It's got a long bend over the, the length of it. So, um, you know, these are uh, for, you know, getting down inside of uh, really uh, acute areas like that uh, ball and claw foot that I was working on when we first started out. So if I was to use this tool, you know, down inside of here, what that allows me to do is make a nice sweeping cut, you know, right down from this web right into the ankle. Whereas if I tried to use a straight gouge, what would happen is it would hit here and it would start to jump and make, make it for a much uh, more difficult cut. Now, a couple other uh, tools that we have here. We have spoon skews, which are an interesting to uh, tool. If we can get a close-up of these two right here, you'll notice that we have a left and a right spoon skew. So what this means is that the, uh, it's a spoon with an angle on the end. So a skew chisel, which uh, if we looked at a, a, uh, a straight uh, skew, it's basically the same but uh, it has the same angle involved, but in this situation, it has the, uh, you know, the spoon so that you can, again, reach down into deep places when you're doing really uh, a deep carving. Now, one of the other uh, specialty tools that we have is what we call a fishtail. And you can see here that I have a number one fishtail and a number seven fishtail. And these fishtails, uh, you know, come out and they spread out on the ends. And this actually works quite well when you have to work in against some of the, uh, the uh, you know, designs that you're working for or to, you know, to get in a, an acute corner or some, something like that. Uh, you know, these are really very handy. Uh, and you'll notice that I'll go to these quite often uh, when, when we start to uh, do our carving. Now, another 
A uh, couple of real peculiar tools is this is what they call a dog leg. As you can see, it's, uh, the bevel is on the top here, and it's got a really acute uh, angle and relatively flat. And this is to you know, work in against the surface of uh, some, some work uh, so you can help to flatten out the, uh, you know, the, uh, the background. Now another interesting tool here is what we call a backbent gouge. Now the difference between a backbend and a, uh, and a spoon is uh, where, let me grab one that's a little bit uh, wider here. If we have a spoon gouge, you'll notice if I flip this over, there's a bevel on the underside and uh, you know it's, it's flat on the top where the, uh, the back bent, which we call this one, is flat on the underside and has the bevel on the top. And this is actually used to you know, go over the top of things uh, in order to uh, lift the handle up. A lot of times if we're making cuts across uh, you know, the, the surface of a, of a piece, the handle can become involved in the, uh, the work that we're doing. So the idea of having that handle angled up in this direction as we're making our cuts, you know, we don't have any difficulty with the handle getting in the way. Okay, we got a couple other funny ones here as well. Uh, this is what they call a, uh, a, a, um, a winged V-tool, or I should probably point out a V-tool to begin with. A V-tool, first of all, is, uh, is, a, is a, a tool that's in the shape of a V. And as you can see, we have different widths as well as uh, different uh, heights as well. We also have uh, various angles. You'll notice that the angle on this particular one is a little bit you know, uh, more vertical than the one alongside of it. Uh, this might even show it a little bit better. So if you look at the difference between these two, this one's almost a 90 degree V, where this one might be a 45 degree V. But the, uh, the numbers on the, uh, the ends of these indicate the actual angle of the Vs. So uh, with that, we have, then we have the, 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 uh, the winged V tool, which actually, instead of the, this surface being straight, it actually has a curvature to it. I don't know. I don't know if you can see that or not on here. Can you get in close on that? All right, so that's a, a winged V tool. Then we also have what they call a macaroni tool, which is sort of strange. It's got a flat bottom with vertical sides, so they're very at right angles to one another. And this is for cleaning up along your, uh, your design so that you can get a vertically straight wall and then also a good flat background. Okay, and then the last tool that we have here is a uh, is one that's a little misshapen as far as the curve goes. It's actually a little flatter on the bottom and then have these heavy curves towards the end. And uh, this is a number 248. Uh, but as you can see, there's a variety of different tools. And uh, let me just grab a, a, uh, some paperwork here and I'll show you the number of tools that actually can be bought. Okay, um, if you take a look at these, this uh, brochure here, uh, these are all the different types of tools that you can buy. So for instance, uh, the number ones in the twos, you can buy in a straight chisel, a skew chisel, a spoon chisel, a skew spoon chisel uh, right, a spoon skew chisel left, and then a, a fish tail. So if there's 19 of these lines on here, that indicates that I can buy 19 of this tool, 19 of that tool, 19 of this one, so on and so forth. So just this one, uh, you know, number ones that I can buy, I can buy almost 114 tools. So um, these lines are actually in the numbers alongside here, indicate the widths that you're buying them in. The lines also indicate the curvature. So if I jump from the one to the two down to the three, you can see that the angle or the curve is starting to increase with, with each one of the numbers. So the number four, it gets a little more increased. Uh, the five, the six, seven, and when you get up towards the eight and the nine, 
they're extremely curved. Now, one of the chisels that I didn't show you was uh, these number 11s, which actually go beyond the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, half round. And if you look at these, they're actually more of a U shape than they are a, um, a half round. So, you know, they're curved at the bottom and they extend up uh, along the sides, creating a, a U shape as opposed to a half round. So uh, these are used for setting in, going around uh, motifs or trying to uh, relieve material. So when we go to you know, set in, uh, which means cut in right up against the line, uh, you know, the, the wall collapses easy and then we don't have trouble with things uh, breaking. So um, you also see that there's a variety of different tools. There's a 100 degree V tool. There's a 60 degree V tool and a 75 degree V tool. So as you can see, you know, I, I figured it out here at one point, you can buy 979 tools if you would like, but uh, most carvers would never have that many. Okay, let me uh, clean this off and then we'll get started on uh, showing you a few basic cuts. Okay, uh, what I have uh, now is, uh, before we start carving any kind, of, uh, any kind of motif or anything, we need to choose a material that we're gonna work in. So what I've uh, done here is assembled a bunch of uh, woods that are used quite frequently uh, in carving. And some of the uh, more recognizable ones are uh, pine, which uh, this is eastern white pine, which is really quite beautiful, especially if you work in between the knots. Uh, we also have some oak. You could also, uh, with the oak, you could use either uh, red or white. White tends to carve a little bit better, and it's uh, wood that you find mostly in ecclesiastical work, meaning church work. Uh, we also have cherry, which is a local uh, species, uh, which is uh, quite nice. It has beautiful color, a little harder to carve than uh, uh, some of the softer woods like the pine. Uh, we have another one that uh, is another fruit wood, which uh, is actually pear wood, uh, which is European pear. It, uh, as you can see, it's a little creamier in color and uh, a little bit more even textured. And uh, this is a real delight to carve because of the, uh, um, the crispness of it when you actually start to cut uh, with it. Another domestic wood would be walnut. Uh, you know, the walnut trees uh, that you get your walnuts from, uh, you know, it has a beautiful color, tends to be a little hard on the harder side, uh, but holds detail really well and uh, has a beautiful color to it. One of the things you want to try and avoid, though, is any materials that have, have any kind of figure in it. You know, people talk about bird's eye maple or crotch mahogany or something like that. Those are very difficult woods to carve. So you want to try to stay with uh, as uh, straight grained of material as possible. Uh, some of the um, other domestic woods is this is uh, poplar. Um, or sometimes what they call a white wood. Um, with the poplar, though, that you can find, uh, you know, they, there are a couple of different species of trees, but they uh, categorize them into a, what they call white wood or um, uh, poplar. But you can notice that this piece of poplar tends to be a little greener. Uh, if you're after any material, you know, uh, part of the problem is the color affects, you know, the motif. Whereas if you want something to be nice and uh, bright and white, you know, a light colored poplar or white wood would work a lot better than this. But the, uh, the green material actually carves a lot better than the, uh, the white material. And then we have some exotic woods. Uh, well, this is a Port Offred cedar, which again is a very, you know, beautiful smelling wood. Uh, comes from uh, the western part of the country, uh, but it has a really, gr uh, it's light and has a really nice uh, texture to it. Uh, you know, even grain, not very porous. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a delight to work with. Uh, some of the more difficult uh, materials that you find are, uh, this happens to be satin wood, which comes from Ceylon or what now is uh, Sri Lanka. And uh, it's a really dense wood, very difficult to carve, but the results, if you, uh, you know, you cut things uh, evenly and smoothly, you get really crisp, uh, you know, definition, uh, but it's a lot more difficult to work as well as uh, the most uh, dark wood, which is ebony. Uh, ebony comes from Gabon, Africa, and uh, this, uh, there's also some other types of uh, ebony, such as Macassar ebony, and um, 
uh, you know, African blackwood. Uh, but these are, you know, beautiful ma uh, materials uh, as far as color goes. But again, the density and the darkness of this makes it much more uh, difficult to, to uh, work. Uh, we have a couple of different types of uh, boxwood. Boxwood tends to be more like a, a, a brush, a, a, a bush, uh, but it has a beautiful texture to it. Again, it's harder. This is really great for figure carving and, uh, you know, uh, material that you want to get extremely nice little, uh, you know, fine detail with. And uh, there's also what they call uh, Costello boxwood, which, um, as you can see, is a little different in color. It tends to be a little tanner, browner, uh, whereas the, uh, the original boxwood has this really nice yellow color to it. You find uh, some of the Asian carvings that they will do a lot of figurines and so forth are done in boxwood, and they're absolutely superb. Okay, then the, uh, one of the favorites of, uh, of most carvers is uh, mahogany. There's uh, lots of different types of mahogany. You find that uh, this is Swatina macrophilia, which comes from Honduras, uh, South America, uh, maybe um, you know, uh, you know, Brazil, places like that. There's also another type of uh, mahogany called uh, Swatina mahogany, which is uh, Cuban mahogany, Santa Domingan mahogany, which is a completely different species, but they're all very similar. And, uh, you know, the difference between them is that this is a little bit more open poured, and uh, the detail that you can get with this particular material isn't quite as refined as the material that you get from uh, the uh, Swatina mahogany or the Cuban or Santa Domingan mahogany. All right, I'm gonna get these out of the way and uh, maybe what we should do is look at some different types of carving next. Okay, uh, what I've done here is I've gathered a few uh, different types of uh, carving that I can show you. Uh, carving is sort of classified into different uh, depths of cut. Uh, you know, some of the real primitive carving was done uh, you know, with either something that could scratch, uh, you know, something into the surface of a board or cut. So when the uh, primitive man was uh, decorating his weapons and utilitarian items that they might use to eat with and so forth, you know, they'd take a piece of flint and they would, you know, cut notches into the edge or something like that. It wasn't until the, uh, the Bronze Age where they figured out that they could take copper and tin and mix it together that they could make any kind of a tool that could, they could actually get some type of a cutting edge on. And at that, that was still a pretty soft piece of metal, but they were able to do some uh, really uh, fabulous work with those types of tools. It wasn't until later on when we developed uh, you know, into the Iron Age where we were able to make uh, metals that were much stronger um, you know, is when you know, carving really exploded. So with some of the primitive carving, what you find is uh, some of the real uh, early stuff is what we call incised carving. And if you uh, focus in on, you know, a couple of these little lines here, um, you know, it, uh, incised indicates what is, uh, what's going on. It's actually incised or cut into the surface of the board without any relief or uh, taking of any material around. So you notice that this little branch and this little swirl are carving that is incised into the surface of the board. So that's the most primitive type. And then once they uh, started going beyond that, um, they started to do what they call chip carving. And chip carving is a series of usually geometric um, you know, designs that, uh, as you can see here, it has this uh, little circle with this uh, six-sided figure in the center with these triangles inside of that and with some incised uh, carving on the surface uh, in between each one of the triangles. And then, uh, you know, little chips of uh, material were taken from the outside. And then uh, you can see that it was accented by these, you know, uh, these curve cuts. And then on the ends of the top here, we have almost like this fish scaling taking place. And then uh, the same representation of the triangle on the ends and, uh, you know, some incised cuts going around the outside of it. 
Then they also used some different decoration on the front where they used this, these crisscrosses that were incised with some lines and then some simple triangles that would left a triangle inside of it, you know, half circles, so on and so forth. So you can get pretty creative with these sort of things. And uh, there's lots of simple cuts. Now these cuts that are made on here, now you, uh, even the back is a little different than the front. This is a great little box that um, Sandra found, uh, you know, at some junk shop someplace and she just couldn't pass it up. She cleaned it up a little bit and it's really, you know, the amount of work that went into this little object, it's really quite remarkable. Um, but once you have, uh, you, once you go beyond the, um, the chip carving, uh, then you start going into some of the naturalistic carving or what you might call low relief carving. And this is a really good example of what a low relief carving might be. These are a couple of brackets that I've uh, carved. Uh, which could be used uh, on a shelf. Uh, but uh, the design, you know, we have a little rosette with a flower in the center of it, uh, with some sea scrolls and some leafage and a little bell flower on the underside of this. And uh, that started off by a drawing and make the cutting out of a pattern so that we could actually cut out the shape of it before we actually do some of the carving. And why we call it low relief carving is because we uh, just lower the background to leave things standing proud in order to uh, you know, give it some, some interest. Uh, we also have things that are sort of a, a minimum relief carving, which is something similar to this, uh, this acanthus leaf, um, where you remove all the background from around the outside and then come back with uh, your carving tools and create the, uh, you know, the curve shapes and the leaves and the stems and so forth after you've taken the, uh, the background uh, back. Then we have some high relief carving, which would be like this uh, festoon of uh, flowers and fruit and leaves and so forth, which is, uh, this is a really great piece of work. You know, when you, you think about it, this, uh, this piece of wood actually started off about this thick and uh, they had to remove all that material from around the outside and get it perfectly smooth and then come back and carve the, the you know, the, uh, the ribbons and the uh, leafage and these uh, looks like apples and, uh, you know, they get some leafage here and a pomegranate and a pine cone and, you know, just, the imagination is really pretty remarkable. But, uh, you know, just to be able to three, see this in three dimension is really, uh, you know, pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, also, uh, then you might go into what we call um, carving in the round, like uh, our golden cod here. Uh, this is a fish that we did in one of the, the carving classes one night uh, where we, uh, you know, drew out the shape of the cod and then everybody had to imagine what the fish actually looked like. You know, we tried to, you know, make, you know, define the, uh, the mouth and the eyes, the gills, all of the, um, the, uh, the fins on it, and then we did incised carving on all the fins in order to create, you know, that uh, bony structure that actually helps them uh, when they swim. Uh, some other carving in the round is, uh, you know, a, a ball and claw foot like you see here, and then we have some low relief carving of the acanthus leaves on the knees with uh, some flowers at the top here. And, uh, you know, this is a pretty advanced work, especially, you know, we have to be able to cut out the shape of the, of the leg uh, into a block and then imagine that that dragon's claw is inside of this block of wood and uh, take all the material away that doesn't belong. So, but this is another uh, different style of uh, ball and claw foot, which is a little bit more uh, interesting and uh, more difficult to do because if you look at the talons on here, uh, you know, they're actually got spaces around them and there's also a space up underneath here so that the ball actually looks like it's floating around in there. And some of these, this work has to be, uh, why it looks so great is because of the undercutting. And the undercutting means that once we develop the claws uh, or the knuckles, we actually curve them slightly so that it really looks as though, you know, they're grabbing a hold of the ball. And then we have some stylized uh, carving on the knee here. Again, this is low relief carving where we have to remove all the material from around this. So this is just standing proud ever so slightly by a sixteenth of an inch or so. Come back and outline all of our shapes and then come back and do some incising and then some slight, uh, you know, cuts in the surface to create the leaves. 
Uh, this is uh, based on a Newport piece uh, from the 18th century. Uh, the Garden uh, Townsends did this type of a form of, of carving uh, back in the 18th century. Now, a couple other interesting ones that, uh, uh, you know, from other countries, these are a couple of either wallpaper or fabric, um, uh, you know, uh, I guess you call them stamps, so that they would ink these uh, things and then, you know, press them onto fabric or, or paper in order to create a design. And if you look at this one here, it's really intricate. I mean, the, the amount of work involved in just carving away all the background to leave all these sinewy lines and leaves and flowers and scrolls and so forth is just astronomical. I mean, I can't imagine the amount of work involved in this. And then this piece, of course, uh, this other piece is a little bit more, um, you know, a, a heavier relief and uh, which creates these nice uh, lines, uh, but it's got a lot of the material has been taken away so that when they, you know, do the stamping that you don't actually end up with too much, uh, you know, overlay when you uh, actually press it onto the fabric. Okay, let me clear this off and we'll uh, talk about a couple other uh, pieces of carving. Okay, uh, you know, this is a pretty remarkable piece of work. Uh, as you can see, uh, you know, this is a stem of orchids with the leaves. This is carved in basswood or lime. And, uh, you know, some of the greatest carvers in the world, there was a fellow by the name of Grindling Gibbons from, uh, from England who did, you know, this naturalistic carving in the round like this. And uh, Derek McDonald, one of my full-time students, uh, did this particular piece of work. And uh, he was really inspired by the Grindling Given book when I gave it to him. And, uh, you know, he carved a couple other pieces and then he came up with this thing, which is pretty remarkable. When you look at the, uh, you know, the flowers on the underside and the detail of them. Uh, but uh, one of the interesting things, this isn't one solid piece of wood. These are individual flowers that are carved and then attached to the stem. Uh, and the stem is then attached to the leaves and so on and so forth. So it's a buildup of different bits of carving as opposed to being carved from one solid piece of wood. But it's really quite a remarkable piece of work, that's for sure. Well, I'm Phil Lowe at the Furniture Institute of Massachusetts, and this is The Art of Woodworking.